Yeah, we have a saying, uh, when you want to do a good job, break a leg. So um, I did that. I hope I meet your expectations. Um, go Seeds. Um, I can't imagine a, a better place, and I'm very happy to be invited. I broke my leg, and I'm still here because the topic is, is, is very near and dear to us. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Seeds. Let me tell you first about genetic resource collections because that's where I'm from. And I think it's a natural to, to look at phenotyping in the context of, of genetic resource collections. I look at it as um, what you're seeing on the screen is a common garden of you know, just lots and lots of different traits that we can characterize. And we all know, that, at least in the gene banking business, that the more that the physical sample is characterized with that associated data, the more it's requested. And so the data and the sample have to go hand in hand. So the phenotyping is absolutely critical for all the work that we're doing um, in terms of the gene banking. But we're going to be usually, when you're talking about phenotyping, you're talking about growing plants. And I'd like to convince you that maybe we can broaden that a little bit. Okay, so this is a, a very boring map of the United States with all the various collections. And what you can see is that we have active, we call them, act, uh, I don't know if I can do this with, I, I talk with my hands, but active collections, those are the field sites. That's where the species experts are. Um, that's where the, the characterization, the, the growing plants are. And I think that this particular type of meeting would be extremely important for our curators um, because they are doing lots of characterizations of the growing plants. But I'm located right there in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's a beautiful spot. You're all welcome. We have, I think, a remarkable facility. Um, and what that facility is, is a great big gene bank, mostly of seeds. So that's what we look at. Um, this is a cultural reference of, the, of Noah's Ark. It's the story of bringing animals, mostly not plants. I think that was a mistake. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of uh, similarities, at least architecturally. Um, the idea, though, is to make great big collections. Um, in our collection, we have about 600,000 accessions. Um, they're roughly divided. It's probably not a, a quite accurate, but about a third cultivars, named cultivars, about a third genetic stocks, and about a third wild relatives. And I work for USDA, that A stands for agriculture, so most of those are um, agriculturally, agronomically relevant um, species. The reason why we can have such a, a huge collection um, is because we're storing, we would call them orthodox seeds, um, and they're very amenable to storage. Each one of those accessions, and accessions for the seeds would be a bag of seeds, is about 1,000 to 3,000 or more um, individuals. And so the numbers get huge. We're well past a couple billion um, individuals. That's a lot, a lot of diversity. Um, and we can do it. We can do it because it's seeds. Um, the number of gene banks around the world are growing. Right now, there are about 1,700, more than 1,700 gene banks, all seed banks, um, and 6 million accessions. And I would like to, it's pretty common for Americans to do this, but to brag just a little bit, um, with 600,000 accessions, with 6 million altogether, that means that the United States is housing about 10% of the, of the world's collections. And these are all totally available um, upon request for research. Um, I like to think of us as the eBay of, of genetic resources. But you can go to Grin. Grin's been renovated, and it's, um, it's got a shopping cart. It's pretty easy to get to. United States distributes about 250,000 accessions a year about a third of that going to international audience or international researchers. So this is a very used collection. And I want to go back to the point I made earlier that a used collection is a documented collection. So the phenotyping and the physical sample have to go hand in hand. Okay, 
So Kimars charged me with talking about phenotyping seeds. We had billions of them in our collection. And my question to you is, well, should we phenotype them? Usually, we're phenotyping agronomic traits and growing plants. So this is a little bit different. And I'd like to explore with you how it's different and maybe how it's similar. First of all, um, rationalizing that, our collections go back to um, our collections go back to the 1920s. Um, this is a, a, a famous experiment that was started in 1948. And so there's a lot of old collections that we have that we can actually explore and look at the various traits as a function of time. And time is a pretty important aspect to, um, to gene bankers. Uh, we look, I, I work on a scale of about 100 years. Um, whereas most of us work on scales of maybe our careers. Um, and that means that I actually collaborate with scientists from the past. This happens to be Fritz Wendt, pl the famous plant physiologist, um, who, looked at, who, who discovered some auxin pathways, by the way. Um, but he had this cool idea of how long seeds would live, and so I very happily have inherited his collection, and we curate that. Um, Another is the geographic context. What we're actually looking for when we have gene banks is that naturally derived um, diversity. And so having a, a genotyping, I mean, a, a geographic context where we can actually look at seeds that come from different ecotomes um, is valuable. They do look different. We can actually identify that. So that might lead into some inferences about how the plant actually will respond. And I'll talk about that at the end of my talk. Um, this happens to be a picture of um, Imke Thorman and um, a Jordan colleague who are looking at wild barley, recollected from the 1980s, the same populations, um, contemporary populations in 2013. So, um, and asking what changed while Jordan became drier with climate change. The seed traits we can see change quite a bit with the process of domestication. What I have here is a slide of um, some seeds in our collection uh, cultivated on the right side. Yeah, right side, I'm dyslexic too. Um, and some wild uh, progenitors on the left, pistachio, coffee, soybean, that's barley, it's wild rice, it's zizania, it's uh, uh, cultivated in the United States. It's the, the gourmet rice that you might get in, in uh, orza rice, um, and sorghum at the bottom. And what you can see is that there is quite a bit of darkening, or should we, probably should say uh, blanching, as the seeds become more domesticated, and also the seed sizes change. Even if it's not actually um, seed size and seed color are not um, breeders' targets. They do inadvertently change, and there's good reasons for that. Um, and also, we get a lot of lousy seeds when there's a bad, um, when the, the growth conditions are bad. And so we can detect that, um, and that actually could come to inferences about um, yield and the quality of the seeds. I want to be honest in this talk and tell you I mean, the technology that was presented this morning and I'm sure that was presented um, for the rest of the week is not the technologies that we use. Part of that is I think, um, I think they think of gene bankers and, and curators that are service type of scientists and not really developing the science. And so the science usually comes quite a bit later. Um, I think it's also an investment in our gene banks that um, can be problematic. Um, but we do carry on some genotyping, but it's of a very small scale. First of all, morphology, and that's usually to verify identification. Um, the mass, the mass is always a bulk mass. It's not a mass of an individual. And so we lose so much granularity in the data just by doing a thousand seed mass. Uh, but they do that, 
for just inventory control. We want to know how much we distribute, and you can weigh a bag, and then you know how much you have left. Um, seed fill, well, you got to know how many, how many live seeds you have, and infestation, well, we don't want to distribute anything that's um, going to give someone else problems and spread diseases. Um, so those are, are also monitored. And finally, of course, viability. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, that's usually because we don't want the, the, um, the seeds to deteriorate um, before they regenerated because, well, that's the whole point, is to be able to have this physical sample that's germplasm. Our collection is growing about 13,000 accessions a year. Our budget just increased this year. Yay, I'm American politics. Um, <laughs> I just shudder. Anyways, um, the, the, last, the, last, um, the last budget increase we had was 2003. So you can do the math. If over, say, a 15-year period, we're increasing our collections, that's the American business model. Other gene banks around the world have different business models, but our business model is that collections will grow, but budgets won't. And what that means, if you think about it, is we're spending less today on a collection than we were 15 years ago. And what does that mean? Did we drop balls or did we increase efficiencies? I'm the research leader for the, for the research group, um, and it's our job to increase um, efficiencies, but we can't keep up with, with that growth. Um, so our question is, I have a curator who wants to stop characterizing the seeds altogether from the list that you have at the top. Um, is, that what we're, is that where we're facing? Or can we look at it a little bit more optimistically and argue with your help, and I'd appreciate that, um, to do it more efficiently um, and to do it more relevantly? Another issue with us is um, that's Dennis Moss in the picture. He retired last year. When I first came to um, NLGRP, we had 15 seed analysts, trained seed analysts. We're down to two um, as of um, now, and one of them is expecting to retire in February. So this is kind of a, a we're at a critical point of um, the human, the staffing aspects as well as the budget aspects. So phenotyping is an important part of knowing that the value of a collection is the associated data as well as the high quality product. Uh, what are we going to do? So let's talk a little bit about seeds. A lot of people think of seeds as rocks. In fact, my, one of my advisors when I was in, at university um, in whole plant physiology, let's do a, a term paper, and it's like, I want to do it on seeds. And his response God love him, Roger Spanswick, is I, I thought you would do it on a real plant. Um, and seeds are real plants. Um, they're just um, part of the life cycle. Um, but what I have here is a little cartoon of um, what it means to be a seed. First, you have some histodifferentiation um, to get all the seed tissues together. And then it's a lot of dry matter accumulation and a lot of accumulation of... I would say things to help you on a camping trip. That's how I broke my leg, and I brought all of that stuff with me. Um, and and that is, I mean, that's the story of a seed. It's, it's kind of survival to make sure. Um, and then they hit a certain maturation point, and then they go into quiescence. And the expectation is that they can come out of quiescence and, um, and germinate. Uh, for this group, I also had some water potential measurements on there so that you could see what was actually happening. Um, but around the, the quiescence points, well, I'll just talk about that in a, in a few slides. So I roughly give these um, different um, parts of, the, parts of the, um, the developmental program as opportunities for phenotyping and what we would learn from those. So this is our, my, well, our whole group's um, foray into some modern phenotyping exercises. This is, um, it didn't take much work for, for us to do this. These are orchid seeds that are ah, 
dust-sized particles. So we're using a, a Keyence microscope with a 200 times magnification. The hardest part about this was spreading the seeds around so that you can do the counting. Uh, the software is, is turnkey, and um, you can see it's a very nice mass distribution um, that we can characterize. We can count them. Um, we can do a lot with this kind of um, analyses. So um, I think this is a, a way of the future for us. But it pales in comparison to this type of work, which, I mean, <laughs> picking up what you, what you see on the, um, the three different seeds is a Arabidopsis, a rapeseed, and barley with different uh, ways of, of picking up the seed. And then they can weigh it or they can do imaging of it. Um, it's really quite remarkable. And then bin it to whether you can plant it or you can put it in different um, stratified um, bins. Um, I think pretty remarkable whether or not we would need to go to this level of, of characterization. Um, I, I don't know that answer. But what you can see um, is so the, the Arabidopsis seed is on the, the bottom three across, and the barley is in the middle, and the rape seed is at the top, and that's mass, and they can measure individual masses, and the three across are different cultivars, so there certainly is a really easy way to distinguish among cultivars, to distinguish among individuals. There's a lot of information that can be gained from this. And this kind of technology would be really, really useful um, when we're dealing with um, wild um, accessions that are collected from wild populations because the heterogeneity of those is huge. And that's probably the hardest part about working um, and, and gene banking wild accessions. Um, this is just a, a slide for the history of, of um, imaging in seeds. 50 to maybe 40 years ago, 50 to um, let's say 10 years ago, um, X-ray um, imaging was pretty common just to find out if they're empty. Nobody does X-rays very often anymore. Um, it's it's expensive. The software isn't isn't updated, and um, it's dangerous. I think we can do better. Um, Robots for seed germination. This is Phil Stanwood's um, prototype robot that he um, invented or, or developed in the early 1990s. And then we can go to the Cadillac for today. And I, the potential is, is pretty remarkable. With that kind of, of imaging of germination, the seed analyst will tell you that it's there's a lot of subjectivity to um, characterizing germination. If you wanted to get health, you really have to um, understand um, and, and, and look at abnormals and growth rate. So with all that imaging, there has to be a lot of software. The problem with it is, is that we work with so many um, accessions of wilds. I said about a third of our collection is wild. That is where the science is going, is collecting um, from wild populations. And this is a, some data from a recently published um, paper on Dahlia carthogenensis, which is an endangered species in Florida. Uh, but Dahlia is pretty common in, the, in North America. Um, it's got a super thin seed coat, which means that it doesn't take up water too well. And what is plotted on the um, x-axis is the days of sowing. And what you can see is that I'm up to 1,500 days. That's five years. Uh, these things are sitting on my desk, and I'm, I'm two years into it from there. Mm -hmm. They're still alive. They're, they're remarkable, but um, I just cannot see a robot um, managing these things for five years and trying to, to check germination. So I think we, we need to take that into account when we're looking at a phenotyping exercise. If the wilds are going to be our number one target because of the heterogeneity that we need to be able to deal with the time 
as well. And I just want to point out my colleague, um, that's Joyce Machinsky, who is um, the scientific director of the Center for Plant Conservation. A lot of the work we do is conservation research um, because the United States has a really nice flora just like Australia does. So what I'd like to do is move into um, the second part of my talk. Well, it's actually about the fourth part of my talk, but tell you about this quiescence because it's something that absolutely fascinates me. Seeds have a remarkable ability to engineer themselves so they can go from a fluid growing system to a dry system. And while they do that, if you and I did that, or if a green plant did that, it would be lethal. But it's not lethal with seeds. And what they actually do um, is form solids, the same kind of idea as a plastic. Um, and so that is quite a bit of the work that I do, is understanding the material science of the seeds. And it's a really complex trait. There are a lot of things. It's composition, but it's also how, how they were put together. Um, so I'm going to give you a little, just a little phase diagram. Uh, I'm a physical chemist by, by training. Um, and most of us work in that um, environment with the x-axis on water content. I could give you, give you a a water potential here. Let's say it's water potential of less than minus one, greater than minus one megapascals. And most of us are working in, in that context uh, when we're doing phenotyping. Things are actually growing. Um, when I'm working with seeds, we're either working in the anhydrous biology level, so that's going to be certainly much less than minus 50 megapascals. Um, and in the cryo, the cryobiology context, I don't even know if anyone knows how to um, do water relations there. Um, they're highly wet, but they're also really cold. So this whole environment um, that I've, I've darkened and labeled as a solid or a glass or a plastic, they all work in the same kind of principles, but it's a different principle than a fluid um, state system. The rules differ. Um, and we have to accommodate that if we want to understand seeds. So let me point out why I was fascinated with seeds in the first place. The organisms don't have the, we know they're alive, but they don't have the same symptoms of living that we consider for most other biological materials. They don't grow. They really don't metabolize. Um, and the change is on a scale that's really, really long. I showed you the time scale uh, of five years, but actually I do work on a 100-year time scale. We know, though, that changes occur. And what I've given you here is some, some things that are probably pretty intuitive for, um, for change, just paper changes. Um, we've seen rubber bands start snapping and, and becoming brittle. So that happens. It happens also with seeds. And when that happens, we lose some functionality. So um, this is the time course for, for how it goes. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, the, there is an initial part where the, you have no symptoms, and then all of a sudden many, many seeds start to die. And that's what I call loss of functionality. That's pretty classic for any kind of material. Um, and then there's that threshold we call longevity, which is fascinating to us. This is a slide of a number of the accessions, the beta accessions um, in the collection. And you can see that if we plot them, their viabilities over the 60-year period, this is a huge variation in how long they were surviving. Um, the, the blue curve is an average, um, but there are things, if, we, if they were 35 to 37 years old, there are some that have not changed at all and some that are completely dead, and we need to know why that is. And if we look at um, among species, we see also a huge variation in how long these things survive. Median is about 54 years. These are mostly stored at 5 degrees. Um, we now do minus 18 in the freezer. Um, but then there are some really short-lived um, ones, and you probably are aware of them if um, Arabidopsis 
goes in the short-lived um, category. It's nasty seed. So <laughs> you laugh, <laughs> but you know it. <laughs> you know it to be true. So a lot of the tricks that I'm wor trying to work on are some longevity assays or some assays about aging that... Um, that you can detect change in the period where it's asymptomatic. So this is one, it's metabolomics, we're just measuring the volatiles. It's very sensitive, we can do individual seeds. Um, it's complex because there are a lot of volatiles that come off of seeds. Another one is looking at the structural integrity, it's mechanical analysis, and we're basically putting a probe on the seed. You can see that's a pea seed underneath a probe, and we can learn an awful lot about the structural integrity of the material. Um, we work a lot with lipids in seeds, and um, this, what you're seeing is a, a differential scanning calorimetry. calorimeter. It's a workhorse in a material science lab. I cut my teeth on it in my PhD program. Um, but it can measure the amount of lipid, but what's really cool is what the food scientists are doing um, with frying, um, with the frying oil and heat abuse, is if they take a sample of that frying oil that's been used too much and you um, measure the crystallization of the lipids, just like when you were in, in high school and you were trying to make crystals and the people who were very meticulous got the A's and the people who had lousy crystals got the, the lower grades. Um, all those, those impurities that are coming with the, um, with the peroxidation of the heat abuse interfere with the, with the crystal, and we can detect that too in seeds that have a lot of lipids. Lettuce is our pet for that. Um, and this is, the, this is the latest and the greatest. We're really having a good time looking at RNA fragmentation. Um, we can do it with dry samples. And what we're figuring is about um, five seeds will give us as much statistical power as a, a germination assay using 100 seeds. So um, it's really important not to use up our seeds and testing them to death. Most of these other assays are, um, are non-destructive. That is destructive. But we're moving into not testing our seeds to death. Okay, I'm just going to go briefly into um, the last phase, and this is going into how we could phenotype seeds in a practical situation. Um, my colleagues Stuart Hardegree and Chris Richards, um, both in our group. And the problem is looking at um, seed establishment after a fire, which um, those of you from Australia would also have a similar, that fire... Um, problem. Um, and we have that in the Great Basin in the United States where the original was a, a sagebrush step. Intense fire comes in and we end up with a cheatgrass monoculture. And we want to be able to restore those lands. And it's dry out there. This isn't like you can plant things and they just come up. Um, it's so, and it's variable. So um, what you have here is just some precip data the annual and, um, and also the spring or the other for um, one area in the Great Basin. And you can see it's just all over the place. So there's a lot of high, high um, unpredictability about what, um, what the weather will be. Oops. Hmm. Huh. Well, the graph that I really wanted isn't showing up. But what I would like to show is um, hmm, that um, it's an interaction in the springtime between precipitation, in the, the whole year, between precipitation and temperature. And what was there was just the fluctuation of the um, temperature and the precipitation um, over a year's period. And below that, um, if we sowed the seeds, the seeds would sit when it was dry, and then um, during the wetter season, the seeds would germinate and establish and grow. But if it was too cold, sorry, if it was too cold, then those seeds um, that germinated in the winter would die, and then we'd have really bad stand establishment. Uh, I think this is your computer, not me. 
<laughs> All right. So um, we talked a little bit about, darn, um, we talked a, l a little bit about a complex trait that's a genotype by environment, by management situation. And what I had here was planting dates at different times, and you can see those dates um, and how the seeds that we would call it a germination syndrome would behave. And what you would see is in the October 1st, that's our fiscal year, so that's when BLM would want to be planting. Um, everything would, would germinate pretty fast in this particular subgroup um, of seeds. Um, also for October 15th and also for October 29th. And the following year, you would have terrible stand establishment because they all germinated and then died in the wintertime. Um, but if you planted them in November 12th, you would actually have a, sub, um, a, a segregating population and you'd be able to see um, some seeds that would die, but some seeds that would persist, and you have better stand establishment. So that's kind of what we're actually looking for in, um, in this group. Uh, none of Stuart's slides work very well. Um, what what um, Stuart is doing is a hydrothermal model. We can do this. It takes an awful lot of data. Basically, he gives them an osmotic stress. Whoops. And I'm going to go through fast. And so we're going to be collecting a lot of data and predicting when, um, when the seeds are actually going to be, um, what, what seed lots will be um, the best to, to apply to the soil um, during the restoration. So here are my takeaway messages. A lot of tools that are available to us, but making them relevant still hasn't happened, and I think we need some good physiologists to do it. Um, and we also need to appreciate that most of what people are looking for right now are wild populations, and a lot of these phenotyping tools are really great when you have uniform populations. Um, and then the quiescence offers something that can scale up in our terms of, of weighing, but imagine if we can understand how seeds can actually go into these um, solids. We would have kind of a secret of life of how, how to stabilize cells for human health or space exploration or anything. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for